Hello baseball fans and welcome into another edition of the British Baseball Podcast. I'm your host Matthew and my guest on today's show played baseball in Britain from 1988 up until 2000 as an outfielder for the Croydon Blue Jays, the Croydon Pirates and the Southern Tigers. He is a freelance journalist and a novelist and has done some amazing research into British baseball history. He is Mr Harvey Soccer. So why not get yourself a cup of tea and your curly wheel is ready and enjoy the show. So after listening to a superb interview on the Reading the Game podcast with Josh Chestwind as their special guest, I finally got a copy of his book on baseball in Europe so I could redo my debut episode in a bit more detail. It's something that I really wanted to revisit the British baseball history angle and I'd learned so much more since the first episode. And that's when Neil Rally messaged me and suggested I speak to our guest today. And what a great move that proved to be. So thank you very much, Neil. And thank you very much, Josh. Not only was your book entertaining and knowledgeable, it's enabled me to find the right questions I needed to make this interview work. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope that you find it insightful as I did. If you love British baseball and history, then you really won't be disappointed. So without further delay, Sit down, buckle up, and enjoy the show. It's British Baseball Podcast. I have a special guest by the name of Harvey Soccer. He is an author and also a 13 years vet of the British Baseball Federation playing his trade with the Croydon Blue Jays and the Croydon Pirates. Harvey, how are we doing? I'm fine, Matt. How are you? I'm very excited to be here with you today. I'm, I'm doing quite well. We're going to talk about some baseball history today. But before we start that, Harvey, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what the game of baseball means to you? Well, I'll put it to you this way. When I was on my on my honeymoon in uh, 1996, I managed to convince my wife to go to an Arizona Fall League game in suburban Phoenix. Um, that's the sort of thing that I like to do on my honeymoon. I've been to baseball games in a lot of different countries. I tried a couple um, going to a game with where I'm heading to on vacation. Uh, I uh, I was thrilled to have the opportunity to play in the Netherlands and very briefly uh, in France with British teams while I was living in the UK, which was between 1988 and 2000. I can't imagine life without the sport. I am waiting with bated breath for the 2020 season to begin, not just as a fan, but as a player too. Despite my advanced years, I'm 58, I still play. Awesome. Which team do you play for at the moment? Last summer, I played in three different leagues. Uh, one was uh, an over 35 league, one was an over 55 league, and one was open age. Awesome. What position do you play? Uh, nowadays, I tend to play first more than anywhere else, but I pitch a bit now as well, which will amuse some of my Croydon uh, former teammates because I never got anywhere near the mound when I was playing in Britain. Back in those days, I was strictly an outfielder. Do you prefer playing outfield, infield, or pitching? What, what would you... What would you choose if you could do it over again? If I won the wish of a lifetime, I'd be a left-handed specialist out of the bullpen for a major league team, the sort of guy who was really, really needed on the field, but who could walk down the street without being recognized. <laughs> Brilliant. So we're joined today to talk a bit about British baseball history. Uh, would you like to talk us through British baseball in its, in its early years? Sure. There were two tours of England by... American Major League and All-Star teams in the late 19th century. The first was in 1874. That was uh, a Boston team and a, a Philadelphia team. And then in 1889, the Chicago White Stockings, as they were then called, the modern day Cubs, played a series of games all over the world against a big league All-Star team. And that tour seems to have triggered some interest in the sport in England. The next year, 1890, they formed a professional baseball league in England. As far as I know, it's uh, it's certainly the oldest league of its type in Europe. It may be the oldest league of its type anywhere in the world outside of North America. I don't know, but it is certainly one of the oldest, um, one of the earliest, I should say. There were only four teams in the league, Aston Villa, Preston, Stoke, and Derby. The Derby team was owned by a uh, local industrialist named Francis Lee, and he had been to the States on vacation and to to look at, and for work for business too, he, he operated a foundry 
in Derby. He thought that baseball would be a good recreation activity for his employees, so he built the ground for them to play. Um, he brought three Americans over to coach and play for the team. One of them, a fellow by the name of Sim Bullas, B-U-L-L-A-S, who was a catcher, had actually briefly played Major League Baseball in the States. One of the others was a pitcher by the name of John Riedenbach, and I'll come back to him in a, in a couple of minutes. The Aston Villa Club was run by a fellow named William McGregor, who Aston Villa football fans, I'm sure, will be quite familiar with. Uh, Mr. McGregor devised a schedule for, it wasn't called for, I guess it was all of the football league, where teams would play each other once at home and once away. That uh, Until he put that into place, matches were called off regularly, and there was, there was no there was no balance to the schedule. And in Preston, the fellow who ran the club there was uh, named William Sudell. He also ran the football club, who had recently won their second straight football league title, and they were, they were used to winning. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Early on in the season, it became obvious that the uh, the Derby pitcher, John Riedenbach, was, was more than the, in particular, Preston and Stoke could handle. So they uh, they had they formed a, a gentleman's agreement, the owners of the four clubs, and they decided that Riedenbach would only pitch against uh, Aston Villa because they're the only team that could touch him, basically. That worked for a short while, but the other Derby pitchers became injured and it was necessary to put Riedenbach on the mound. Shortly thereafter, he started a game in Preston and the Preston manager told his batters just to go up to the plate and stand there and do nothing. Uh, um, the <laughs> one batter was walked over the course of the game, but apart from that, Riedenbach ended up with, with a very, very tainted no-hitter of sorts. And um, shortly after that, Francis Lee decided that this was all silliness, and he, um, he withdrew the Derby team from the league altogether. The, th the three other teams carried on without Derby. Aston Villa had some very interesting players on the team including a guy by the name of John Deavy, who was a, a cricketer for Warwickshire and a footballer for Aston Villa. He had a very, very uh, successful uh, cricket career, and um, he was the 1890 National League baseball batting champ. He had a batting average of 428 for Aston Villa. Riedenbach ended up staying with Derby and uh, played for, the team was reformed when British, when English baseball was restructured such that it was purely amateur. And Riedenbach helped Derby to win, I believe, a couple of national titles later on in the decade. There were some uh, successful clubs in the South as well. One, they were called the London Thespians, was comprised entirely of music hall entertainers. Player manager of that particular club was a Canadian American born in Canada and raised in the States, a fellow named uh, Richard George Knowles. And he used to, um, he played the West End. He was a very popular comedian at the, that particular time. His players included other comedians and there were a couple of guys on a team who were successful minstrels. That is to say, they would they'd do their Al Jolson bit, basically. That sort of thing is obviously frowned upon nowadays, but it was an extremely popular form of entertainment at the time. The London Thespians won a couple of uh, English baseball championships in the early 1890s. And there was uh, a little bit of popularity of the sport in the Northeast as well. There was a team in Middlesbrough called the Pioneers that was quite successful. Their squad included a couple of um, association footballers as well. Yeah, there's one thing I noticed when I was doing my research is that there seems to be a lot of football clubs or soccer clubs that went hand in hand with baseball with a lot of grounds being shared to play with it and it was really interesting how when i did my first episode when this originally about how derby county's ground was it literally stood for just over 100 years like 1895 to 1997 which was originally purpose built for baseball specifically yeah as i understand it the corner of the pitch where home plate was located was called catcher's corner and a lot of the Derby County supporters would refer to it by name without really knowing the history of it. I, I should add Crystal Palace to the mix as well. There was a Crystal Palace baseball club that played at Crystal Palace, the you know the uh, the amusement the amusement park in South London. Um, if you were to go down to the small museum that they have, or an area uh, library that has a local history section, if they've got 
programs for Crystal Palace, not the football club, but the actual amusement park. It'll mm. give a list of what's on that particular day. And quite a few times uh, when I was looking through those programs, I found references to matches that were scheduled on those particular days. Baseball matches, I should say. So where are we going to next on our, on our historical tour? Well, as you mentioned, there were clubs that were associated with uh, with football clubs. And uh, in London, in the first decade of the 20th century, the likes of Tottenham Hotspur and, and Clapton Orient had their own baseball teams. I believe Brentford did it as well. That, that's an area of potential research for someone because um, I never really got the chance to look into that decade very much during yeah, my own I've, research. I found Arsenal, which we know as Woolwich Arsenal, then Spurs, Fulham, Brentford, Leighton and Chelsea, all teams have football clubs around that, that London region. I was lucky enough to, uh, when I was playing for the Croydon Blue Jays, one year we we played out of the old Spotted Dog, which was a Henry VIII era pub in Forest Gate in East London, and we played at uh, we played immediately next to the pub on the grounds of uh, Clapton Orient Football Club, which was I don't know if they still exist. They won the FA Amateur Cup, I think at least a couple times in the first part of the 20th century, and we would go to the pub after matches sometimes. It was very very different compared to our South London homes because it was much more urban and less suburban. So we touched over the early 19, 1900s. Is there anything you want to gloss over around that period? If I'm not mistaken, that the match that was played in front of King George V was at Stamford Bridge, right? Yeah, yeah, Chelsea's it's ground, worth, yeah. It's worth mentioning that there were amateur pl- clubs that were playing out of Stamford Bridge regularly in the 20s. There were, from what I recall, they were mostly uh, comprised of expats, but but and at least one of those expats ended up getting involved in baseball in London when they formed the uh, the semi pro league there in 1936. His name was Max Joubert. How was baseball? How popular was it before and after the war? In the 1930s, it, that was British baseball's heyday. There's I don't think there's any question about that. Crowds of uh, numbered in the thousands fairly regularly for some clubs and the largest crowd ever to see a domestic baseball match in England, about 10,000. That match took place in the 30s in Hull. It was a cup final between a local side and Romford. The cup was a national competition. The, uh, the leagues that existed at the time were, were strictly regional. And so what, what other things can you tell us about the, the golden age of, of baseball in, in, in Britain? Well, some of the venues were quite interesting. There were a lot of clubs that played their home matches at Greyhound racing tracks. As you can imagine, the infields of dog racing tracks are not really suitable for baseball. So clubs came up with some ingenious ideas for ground rules. Um, the team in Catford in South London, which was made up by a bunch of American Mormon missionaries, by the way, they had a couple of posts that were on the verge of the track itself. And if the ball went over the fence between the first post away from the foul line and the foul line in right field, that was, I think, either a double, possibly even just a single. And then there was another post farther out. Balls hit to the right of that were a double, and anything hit to the left of the, the leftmost post were genuine home runs. And they didn't even need a fence in left field because the the dimensions of the field down the left field line were were enormous. That was in Catford. In Romford, in the same league, they decided that they would orient the diamond so that the line between home and second base was perpendicular to the, uh, the track, which meant that your shortest dimension by far was straightaway center field. Um, but that's they tried it and and they they lived with it for as long as the club that was based there existed. There were other dog tracks that had much bigger infields where it wasn't such a problem, like um, Custom House Stadium, also known as West Ham Stadium, not to be confused with Upton Park. That um, West Ham Stadium was in Custom House in East London, and apparently the capacity was something like eighty thousand people. It was an enormous place. There was a football club there, a professional football club, for a couple of years. They were called Thames FC, 
the West Ham baseball team in the London Major Baseball League, one of the semi-pro leagues in the 30s was based there. Um, there was a team that was based for one season at the stadium in Shepherd's Bush, whose name eludes me. Uh, it was the stadium that was the main stadium for the 1908 Olympics. White City, White City Stadium. Okay. And you had similar sorts of um, stadiums used in the north of England, places like Salford and Sheffield and so on. And I suppose in the 30s as well, we had founded Little Woods football pools. Sir John Moores, he, he um, facilitated a lot of baseball when he founded the National Baseball Association to help grow the game, which I've been told was done based on a dare by the Major League Baseball head at the time, John Hader. I, I, I haven't heard that story, but I can I, I certainly agree that John Moores was uh, was, was the kingpin of, of baseball, certainly in the north, maybe in the south, too. He uh, he did a lot to publicize it. And I, he, I suspect that he probably sunk a fair amount of change into it, too. Yeah, those 18 amateur baseball teams were established within Liverpool alone within like the, ni- the early 1930s. And it was a lot of his, his backing. Um, it helped baseball grow in, in Oxford and Birmingham and London as well. I don't know if if he contributed to the funds that were used to pay players who were brought over from uh, from Canada and the U.S. There were um, there were several such players. A bunch of uh, a bunch of Montrealers ended up playing in the London League. There were some players who were actually moonlighting ice hockey players. They were playing for the likes of the, the ice hockey team in Brighton the teams that were at Wembley Arena, um, Harringay and so on. And um, rather than go back to Canada for the summer, they found out that baseball was going to be played in the summer and that they could make some money doing it. So they stayed and, and ended up playing sport in England for the whole year for uh, for several years in the 30s. Awesome. I believe um, as well that we, we talked earlier about some players playing baseball that were in different sports. Dixie Dean, who is an Everton legend, played for the Liverpool Caledonians. And just him himself was attracting crowds there. Are there any other famous faces in baseball that that used to cross over? Yes, I neglected to mention uh, Steve Bloomer, who was Derby County's all-time leading goal scorer. I think he still is. He played second base for the baseball team for several years in the 1890s. I've also been told as well, and I don't know what truth is it, that David Bowie was quite keen on baseball and uh, former Everton Manchester City manager Joe Royal as well uh, in the 70s. But I think we're, we're, we're skipping a bit uh, far ahead of ourselves there. Do you want me to talk about David Bowie briefly? Yeah, please. Yeah. OK, I can confirm that David Bowie was definitely interested in baseball when he was young. The club that he used to train with was the same club that I played with my first six years in England. The the uh, what well, they were the Croydon Blue Jays when I played for them, but they were the Beckenham Blue Jays when uh, David Bowie was a a wannabe outfielder for them. Uh, he was a teenager at the time, from what I understand. He was very keen, but he may not have actually gotten into any matches because he was uh, he just didn't have the the talent at that time. And I can say that for certain because the the, my information source is a former Croydon Blue Jay teammate who was the same age as David. Their their moms used to carpool them to um, to away matches and so on. So my oh, former teammate knew David reasonably well. I bet some stories to be out there. That's brilliant. In in the mid the mid thirties, we we had the professionally founded um, called the North of England Baseball League, and that was centered around Manchester, and that was mainly U.S. and Canadian players and athletes from sports like football and rugby. And that led to the creation of a few more professional leagues, the, the Yorkshire League and the London, London Major Baseball League as well. And it's around about the, the mid-1930s when it got its first live broadcast on radio, and that was the Alden Greyhounds and the Rochdale Greys. Yeah, the Greys were another team that was comprised of American Mormon missionaries. And there was a story about them that I was told by a former player from the team. This is a long time ago, about 20, 25 years ago. And I stumbled upon a newspaper article in the local press that said exactly the same thing. They used to go into a huddle immediately before matches and just just like, you know, rah, 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 sis, boom, bah, go team, that sort of thing. But um, the, the local scribe thought that they were actually having some sort of religious meeting at the plate immediately before the match. 
And he was a bit put off by that and said as much in the newspaper. And, and some people in the uh, some people in the community who read that, I think, were a little bit put off by it as well. And, but the, the, yeah. club, the record straight said that's not the purpose of our pregame meetings. We're just we're just gearing up for the match and getting everybody's head in the game, so to speak. Cool. What's your favorite story from from the 30s? Well, being Canadian, I was very uh, chuffed to see references to a Canadian by the name of Roland Gladue, who played for West Ham for two years in the 30s as the Canadian Babe Ruth. Uh, Roland Gladue was, to be a bit cruel, an all hit no field player who played in the minor leagues in North America for well over a decade. He played in London in 1936 and 1937 and made it to the major leagues for about a month during the 1944 season as a third baseman with the Boston Braves, now the Atlanta Braves. His arrival was heralded in the local press. Um, he was injured uh, before he ever played a game for West Ham, but his first at bat for West Ham was as a pinch hitter in a match and the game was on the line and he hit a home run to win the game. So uh, as we sort of leave the 1930s and move into the 40s, is there anything else you'd like to cover before we, we move on? I would like to talk about the 1938 test series. There was a, uh, it was referred to as a test series between the American amateur national team, which was slated to go to the 1940 Summer Olympics, which of course never happened. And they were, they were touring and they played a number of games against what was basically an all-star team of players who were playing in England at the time. The, the England team, as it was called, had uniforms with the Union Jack on the chest and they, uh, they beat the Americans at their own game, fairly handily, it must be said. One of their star pitchers was a fellow from small town Ontario near Ottawa um, named Ross Kendrick, who ended up staying in England and I think he coached as well in the Midlands, well into middle age and possibly beyond, I'm not really sure. Um, and there was another pitcher on the team named Jerry Strong, who actually sailed to England with Roland Gladue and a third fellow to play ball for West Ham. Jerry Strong helped England to win that test series as well. And they played the matches at the Shea in Halifax, Craven Park in Hull, I don't remember the other venues, but I could find that out if necessary. World War II then comes along. Uh, games were played throughout the hostilities, and in 1943, the US Air Force played the US ground troops at Wembley in front of 21, approximately 21,000 spectators. Are there any interesting stories you can tell us from the 1940s? A former Blue Jay by the name of Bob Shearer, who, is, who has passed away, joined a club in Eltham in Kent as a result of coming into contact with with the Catford Saints, the Mormon team that existed in London in the 30s. Bob was going home on a train. Bob was born and raised in British Columbia, but moved to England as a, as a young adult in the mid 30s. And he was heading home on the train and he saw baseballs flying through the air. So he got off the train, walked over to Catford Dog Track to see what was going on. And um, they gave him an impromptu tryout on the spot and they were interested in him, both as a baseball player and as a possible convert. And Bob was happy to play baseball with them, but he he didn't want to convert to Mormonism, so he he kind of uh, he he left the scene. But he did, uh, in a roundabout way, hook up with with a team called the Elton Dodgers. And after playing for the Dodgers for a few years in the 1940s, um, he joined the Blue Jays, which is how I came into contact with them in the 40s. The Elton Dodgers helped to publicize a, movie, a baseball movie that was playing in local theaters at the time called Kill the Umpire, which starred an actor by the name of uh, William Bendix. He was also the star of a period movie from the same time called The Babe Ruth Story. It's, in my personal opinion, it's not as good as the, the Babe Ruth biopic that stars John Goodman, but um, it's fun. And it's just kind of interesting to note that um, that at least one English team helped to publicize that movie. Basically, that what that means is that they they dressed up in their uniforms and their dress shoes and uh, put their caps on and hung out 
outside the theater with signs on a car uh, advertising the film. So after the war, there's still lots of North American soldiers in the UK providing experience to teams. Some stories right from the North of England as well. So we, we have the Stratford Saints, which is a team that I'm, I'm now researching into and, and hoping to do a bit of a documentary about. And Andy Parks, who played for them, said that they used to recruit players from local factories. As soon as you'd find out that there's a North American in one of the factories, did did literally run over there and try to tempt them to come come play baseball. And Wally O'Neill was recruited, and he began to lead the Saints to numerous championships. Are there any any uh, interesting stories from players from coming out of the 40s in in any of the leagues that you can tell us about? Well, I do know that there were clubs in the South that used to uh, recruit in exactly the same manner. They'd find out that there was um, there was somebody with a North American accent living in a certain road, and they'd they'd literally go and knock on his door, and um, and ask if he was interested in playing ball. And I I know that they that there were at least a couple of clubs in the South that that successfully found players doing it doing that. And so we'll we'll move into the 1950s, and baseball was included in the Festival of Britain exhibition in the early part of 1950s and although Scottish League was started with the help of US servicemen in the late 50s uh, city officials and groundsmen of Edinburgh were really happy to help baseball be promoted over cricket preferring the US sport to be beating out the the English one uh, which I found was quite amusing there's there's only five teams as well and they came from Edinburgh, Leith, Glasgow and that league lasts until 1960. Yeah, any any tales you can share with us from the 50s? I can say that by the time the 50s rolled around, baseball was really popular in one small town in the Cotswolds, and remain and it had been started up in the 20s, and I think it lasted into the 1960s. The town's called Chipping Norton, and wow. there was a local scoutmaster whose name was Fred Lewis, who um, decided that baseball was the game for his kids he felt that it was it had advantages over cricket and that you wouldn't find yourself in a situation where the same fellow was batting for for an hour and through him baseball became popular in the town and remains so for decades is there anything you can tell us about baseball in the 60s well great britain's national team had their best ever finish at the european championships in 1967 they finished second to be fair, it should be said that the Netherlands and Italy, who tend to be the top two in Europe every time the competition is run, neither of them participated in the competition that year. But even if Britain had finished fourth, it would have been their best showing in the competition. So we can move into the 1970s of baseball. Jeff Archer wrote about his efforts to develop baseball in Great Britain during the mid 70s and early 80s. But he sort of eventually moved on to Holland where baseball is more developed. And then we have conflict between the governing bodies in baseball. So you've got the British Baseball League, which was based in the southeast of the UK, and the National Baseball League, which represented the Midlands and the Northern teams. What can you tell us about that sort of time period, please? Um, when you, uh, Mr. Archer, you're talking about uh, the fellow who wrote Strike Four? Yes, that's the one. One of the leagues that uh, that existed for a brief time in the 70s, which I think he, he was involved in in the in the formation of, was um, was a league that played out of a small rugby stadium that's on the South Circular, whose name escapes me. It was because it was a confined stadium, they could charge admission. That's what they did. It was similar to the Scottish Amicable Bowl National League that existed in the late 80s. But this was 15 years earlier, roughly. There was a team in that league called the Spirit of 76, which was mostly, if not all, American expats. Apparently, crowds at uh, at the rugby club to see this Saturday league in action, the crowds were pretty good. But um, there were a couple of incidents on the field that um, that put off the people who ran the the rugby club. So when time time came to negotiate rent for the following season, I think the rugby club just backed off and said, no, we don't want to have uh, anything to do with you anymore, which is, a, which is a shame, of course. Yeah, yeah, that is a shame. So we, we've had the conflict between the, the, the British Baseball League and the Northern Baseball League. Let's uh, crack on into the 80s. 
One of my favourite stories from the the era in the 80s of British baseball was when Graham Gooch had a home run battle with uh, Mr Cubs, Ernie Banks, at the Oval. I think Graham Gooch was in his early 30s and, and Ernie was pushing nearly 60 at the time and, and that no one's really got an official score from it, but I've heard that Ernie won either 3-0 or 5-0, depending on what sources you, you sort of look into. Now, what are your favourite tales from, from the 80s in British baseball? Well, in 1989, the one season that I was in the National League, we did something that my friend Bob Prentice had done in Eltham with the Eltham Dodgers in the late 40s. We publicized the movie. This time it wasn't in Eltham, but we were wearing our street sh- our street shoes and our uniforms and our caps, and we were playing catch in front of one of the main movie theaters in the in the West End near Leicester Square. That was to promote the European premiere, I believe, of Major League. Um, That was a fun evening because uh, the people who were promoting the movie had put together a bunch of former Major Leaguers who were touring with the film. They were with us at the theater that night. And a couple of days later, they played a friendly against the British national team at Old Trafford Cricket Stadium in Manchester. And that was the All-Star team with Hall of Famers Bob Feller, Willie Stargill and Billy Williams? Yes. Yeah, it's Britain lost 16-3. The 1990s, we're, we're, we're coming quickly up to up to date. There's quite a lot of things I found that was happening around the 90s with the 100th anniversary of organised baseball in, in Great Britain. Entrepreneur Malcolm Leeds organised a new league, the National League, to to play in large stadiums to attract fans back to the game. But again, there was a split, the National League and the British Baseball Federation at the time, with a lot of decent players going with the Northern League. And they're actually banned from playing any BBF-related organisations, including the national team. Any any stories there you want to tell us from the 90s? My own club was embroiled in that, that hullabaloo in the 90s. Uh, the Blue Jays played in Malcolm Needs' league for one year. I don't remember the reasons why we decided to split from the BBF. It may have been that we we perceived originally that the competition would be better or better suited for us at least. Uh, we had a very good season the one year that we were in the National League. Mm. Uh, it may have been at the time better for us in terms of travel too, though I don't recall whether or not that's definitely the case. Did they change some rules regarding foreign players at the time to try and get um, encourage the foreign players to sort of spread their talents out try to encourage them to develop clubs that that didn't have them did did that work or did it it backfire well based on the fact that it didn't last very long I would say that it was a failure I was personally affected by that because the Blue Jays were about a 50-50 mix of expats and local guys Hmm. and I ended up being platooned with one of the other players because of the fact that uh, I think in 1989, possibly in 1990, we were restricted to having four imports on the field at a time. Hell for the umpires as far as uh, policing is concerned, but that was the rule at the time. And I, I've, I still, when I occasionally am in contact with some former teammates, they'll say that I got the short end of that particular stick because amongst the imports on the team talent wise at that time I was probably low man on the totem pole that said I should still have been playing in this is in my my teammates opinion not my own Um, my teammates told me that I should have been playing more than I was and that I was I was uh, that was a kick in the pants as a result of that rule being in place any other tales from the the 90s you'd like to to tell us about I'd like to go back to the 80s for a sec you mentioned that uh, Bob Feller was in the group that came to England to uh, to promote uh, Major League. Bob Feller was the favorite player of a fellow by the name of Barry Mayfield, who was a baseball fan as a result of having listened to Armed Forces Radio when he was young. Barry played for a long time. His love of the game was passed on to his son, Lee, who was a shortstop for various clubs in the South when I first uh, was playing in England. And at one point during Barry Mayfield's life, he wrote to Bob Feller and said to him, if you ever want to come to England, 
we'll put you up at the house. And at one point, a fellow wrote back to him and said, I'll take you up on your offer. Thank you very much. And this was after I was already playing um, in England. And I we found out that Bob Feller was going to be at our diamond on a Saturday afternoon, giving out pitching lessons to anybody who wanted to listen. Wow. So we got a, we got a, it was just for about, I don't know, 45 minutes or an hour. But yeah. How often do you get the chance to meet somebody like that under circumstances like that, where he's not going to have minders and 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 a posse of people protecting him from uh, from anybody who they perceive to be a threat? He was just a regular guy. What I, I don't know how he got to the diamond, but he just walked walked to the diamond from the parking lot and shook everybody's hand and just talked pitching for a while. In retrospect, I wish I knew as much about him then as I do now because I would have talked his ear off uh, pardon me I would have I would have pelted him with questions yeah yeah no indeed I think it's amazing if you can meet your idols or people you look up to and get knowledge from them like that I mean I, I've, I've been very fortunate in in my short time of of training I've had a lot of input um, from some very good coaches in Manchester and even through doing the podcast I've been able to talk to people involved in the Great Britain national team and other clubs and they've all been able to help me out and give me advice and tips and pointers and I found that absolutely invaluable it's it's brilliant I just wish I was in a position I think we all do that, that we could put it into practice I'd like to ask you a couple of personal questions if I can Harvey what what are your favorite memories of, of playing in, in British baseball I think overall, the camaraderie and the the humor involved in being part of a team. One of the things that I miss most about living in England is the self-deprecating sense of humor that pervades the country. That particular attitude does not exist here, and I miss it a great deal. And when you combine that with the camaraderie that forms when you're part of a team, in a team sport, it's it's a magical combination. Yeah. Who were your heroes in, in baseball? When I was growing up, my baseball hero was Pete Rose. This was long before he became a betting manager. Um, hmm. At the time, there were usually two matches on TV in Toronto every week. There was an Expos game during the week and during the evening and the NBC game of the week, which was on Saturday afternoon. And because the Reds were good at the time, they tended to be on uh, the game of the week quite often. And I just thought, that this, here's this guy who can hit over 300 from both sides of the plate. He doesn't, he, he runs like, a, like an American football player and not a very fast one at that. He's not very good with the glove, but man, the guy, he, the guy can flat out play. And um, so he was my, my biggest baseball hero when I was a little kid, when I got a little bit older, it tended, um, my heroes were, were various and sundry members of the Blue Jays, but they first took the field when I was about 15 and a half. So it's, that's your heroes at 15 and a half are very different from heroes when you're about nine. Yeah. So have uh, any uh, memorable games that you recall from, from your playing days in Britain? <laughs> oh yes. Some of them have nothing to do with the action on the field either. I remember, uh, Croydon Pirates played our home games at Roundshaw Playing Fields, which is where Croydon Aerodrome was located. And um, there was one day I was walking towards the diamond from uh, Wadden, which was the, or, uh, the local railway station. And the way that the, the approach to Roundshaw was via a walkway that had um, an industrial state on one side and just an open field on the other. And then you come sort of over the brink of a very, very small hill, and then you would see the diamond off in the distance. And as I was reaching the brink of that hill, I saw all of these quite fancy trailers and caravans on the field, not just on the uh, not just on on the field that was, was you know for multi use on one side of where I was walking. I, I'm talking about our diamond. Our diamond had a whole bunch of trailers, and I thought, well, there must be some sort of caravan show going on and I was looking for a, like a marquee or something like that so I could find out about it and more more and more so find out whether or not we were going to be playing baseball that afternoon 
Well, it had nothing to do with a show. It was um, the park had been invaded by travelers. And um, I, uh, I got to where our bench was next to the diamond and I spoke with our player manager and he said, yeah, apparently this had happened in the past before I was involved with the club and he was going to speak with one of the people who was one of the travelers and asked them nicely if they could at least vacate our field for the afternoon and then um, and then we could play ball. And that's and to his credit, he was able to accomplish that. Um, but by the time they took their uh, their vehicles off of the diamond, there, well, well, let me say when I first got there, not only were, were the um, were the vehicles there, there was a horse grazing in the outfield. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they, they they moved the vehicles, they moved the horse, and um, a few of them actually stuck around and watched us play. It was it ended up being a good afternoon, but it was a rather inauspicious start. Yeah, and a great way to start the day. So you you said you you know quite a lot about British baseball and British baseball history. How did that come to be? Firstly, it was anecdotal. The, a lot of the stories that I heard were I heard first from from teammates fathers of teammates when i first joined the croydon blue jays four of my teammates had canadian fathers who had stayed in england after serving in the canadian armed forces of world war ii and then just curiosity ended up taking me to uh the newspaper library in collindale and although i, I made a, a snide remark before about going through um about my eyes going buggy looking at microfilm there are a lot of original documents at the newspaper library too and that's ideal because you can just browse at your leisure and not have to f refocus uh, whenever you get a new roll of film so it was as i say it was it was anecdotal through teammates and parents of teammates and uh and my own research you've written a book yourself yes the book took a very very long time to put together i first started interviewing people for it in the mid 90s and the book came out in 2011 the reason there are many reasons why let's 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 chalk it up to life is what happens when you're busy making other plans <laughs> i know you mean I, i've been trying to write a kids book since 2015 so there you go it's only five years but at least i know i can still be successful a couple of years later I, I regret that the book had to come out after some of the people who i had interviewed had passed away because I would have liked to have given them the opportunity to read it. Yeah. What's the book about, for those that don't know? Give, give us a title and where, where we can find it, please. It is called The Blokes of Summer. That is a spoof of the title of a well-known baseball book called The Boys of Summer, which was written by Roger Kahn. And it's mm -hmm. about, I believe, the 1955 uh, Brooklyn Dodgers. is sort of a Where Are They Now book. It's very well known. It's available on Lulu, which is the print-on-demand company. It's www.lulu.com. And the book is really two books in one. The first half is all history. It covers the 1890s through to the late 1950s. And then I gloss over the 60s and 70s and start right in with my own memoir of having been a baseball player in England for 13 years. Lovely. All right. I'll, uh, I'll add that to my shopping list of, of things to look out for. Harvey, that brings us towards the close of our show. Thank you very much for entertaining us with some wonderful stories. I would like to leave the, the last word open to the guests. Is there anything you'd like to talk about or, or anything that we haven't covered? No, thank you very much for having me. No problem. Um, have you got any shout outs you want to give or is there anything that you want to sort of promote yourself before we knock it on the head? I'd like to give a shout out to my former teammates who I miss. There's too many to name. <laughs> they, they'll, they'll know who they are. Yes, absolutely. No problem. Well, Harvey, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've enjoyed every minute of this. It's been great to to discuss um, British baseball history at, at length with you. And I wish you all the best of luck with your, with your own book. Thanks very much. Thanks again for Harvey for sharing those wonderful stories with us. I, I hope you really did find that fascinating. If you've got any feedback you'd like to give me, what was your favourite period? Or if you want me to try and find any more clubs to look deeper into, just drop me a message on Twitter or an email at BritishBaseballPodcast at gmail.com. And now that you've finished with the show, why not give us a subscribe, review us if you can, and follow the podcast on your preferred podcast app provider. 
you can find us on twitter facebook and instagram at baseball pod and so that's me for today uh, join me next week for some more special guests and have a great time take care now Ta-ra.